you reign on high every mountain stream every sunset sky but my one request lord my only aim is that you'd reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the lord of all i am so won't you reign in me again over every thought over every word may my life reflect the beauty of my lord you mean more to me than any earthly thing so won't you reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the lord of all i am so won't you reign in and greet those around you.
Waiting here for you. 
Pastor Dave is out right now, and I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, someone who's a dear friend of mine. I met him at InterVarsity in Castleton campus, and there I began to learn that he has a compassion 
for serving other people. Throughout our friendship, he has continuously been there to walk through the highs and lows of my life. We poured into each other's walk. We've grown each other's faith. He's a dear friend and also a co-worker. In Awana, we pour into the lives of children. We regularly teach them the word of God, sing with them, play with them, talk with them. This is his gift to work with youth. And it extends not only to Awana, but into teen ministry, into serving in things like the play with Jonah, helping kids by building relationships with each other and God, something that we're all about here at Calvary. And more than that, he's a brother. He's our brother. He's one of us. And regularly, he pours this servant heart into our ministry, into our youth, and into our lives. And today we have the privilege to hear from him. We have an opportunity to hear from someone we love and we appreciate. And we take this opportunity to hear from him, to support him as he goes forward into a new frontier of servant ideology, a new frontier of being a pastor. We support him in this. We thank him for what he's done here and we remind him that he will be missed. Please help me welcome Brian Ward. Right, that was a bit sentimental. Awesome. So as you have said, um, Pastor David's out, um, but I met with him, it would have been Friday, to really prep for this sermon, to prep for what I want to share with you guys. Because as Jacob said, um, I worked a lot with the teens, a lot with the youth, a lot with the children. But you see, what's interesting actually is that if you guys knew me when I was younger, my parents are here so they can actually tell you when after this service is over. Hopefully they don't embarrass me. <laughs> but you see, when I was younger, actually, I wasn't the kind of person who'd be up here talking. I would not be the kind of person up here working with the youth, with the teens, with the children. Because you see, when I was younger, I actually hated to be out in public. You see, I had something really bad in my life, anxiety. And you see, I know some of you guys may struggle with that. And you guys know how it means to be in a situation where you're uncomfortable, where you don't feel like you belong. And you see, so when I was younger, I had social anxiety where I would not want to leave my house. And actually, kind of, in my, in my mind, put me a prisoner of fear. And that's interesting because I'm up here today preaching on the peace of God and how that can change our lives. And if, like I said, if you guys knew me when I was younger and you saw me today, you would say, that's impossible. But we know that anything is possible with God, the grace of God. So I want to pray today before I really talk about my sermon and what it means to know peace. Let's pray. God, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for this moment, God, that all honor, praise, and glory be to you, God, for this moment. I pray today, Lord, as people are listening, God, that they're not hearing my words, but they're hearing the passion that I have for your word, God, that I want to speak for today. Allow hearts to be changed, God, according to your will, God, according to your plan, Lord, that people will receive what I'm saying because it is the words that you have spoken to my heart. Amen. See, what I, love, what I love about Philippians is that the author was Paul. We know him as Saul, who actually persecuted the church. But you see, what people don't think about is that when Paul wrote Philippians, he was actually in jail. He wasn't in the comfort of his house, of a community that encouraged him, that believed in him. He was actually in a jail cell, in a Roman prison. But you see, his focal point when he wrote Philippians was to encourage, was to teach, was to empower believers to walk in God's will, to walk in the things of God. And see, that's kind of interesting, as I said. Sometimes fear, anxiety, worry make us a prisoner. But you see, Paul didn't let that stop him. Paul said, okay, God, I'm going to glorify you in this moment. I'm going to use this opportunity to be in prison, to witness to you, and to write letters to my brothers and sisters in the faith to encourage and to empower. So as I said, we're in Philippians today. Um, Philippians chapter 4. 
Um, so if you guys want to turn there with me, we're going to be using verses 4 through 9. You see, what I love about this verse is that it really encapsulates my life. The fact that this song talks about the rugged cross and what it means to know salvation, what it means to be changed by that, we see in this verse. Verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if you guys didn't hear me, we're talking about peace, what it means to know peace in the midst of a situation in our lives. Now, as I was thinking about this verse, I was trying to figure out what it means to know peace and how we start to know peace and how we finish with sharing that peace with others. And I really thought about five aspects or five points of what it means to know peace. You see, there is the preparation, there is proximity, there is prayer, there is praise, and there is practice. You see, within these five aspects, we really see in this text what it means to know peace, what it means to have joy and to rejoice. You see, when Paul wrote this, in verse 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, for those of you who are parents, you know you have to tell your kids something twice, maybe three times, until they listen. <laughs> I know my parents do that to me. But you see in this text, Paul says rejoice, not once but twice, because he is trying to hit home the idea that we as Christians should be rejoicing in the things of God. Now you might think that's hard because there's so much stuff going on in our lives. And I'm there with you. It is hard at times to find where God is working. But that is when we must be still in our spirit, in our lives, to look at God and see what he is doing in our life. You see, when Paul wrote rejoice, it is a verb. Now, I'm not the best in grammar, but I know that's a verb. But you see, when he is saying that to rejoice, it means that we must take action. It doesn't just mean that we sit here and hear that verse and say, huh, that's a good idea, I should rejoice, but I'm not going to do it now. So I actually encourage you guys to think about your life Think about a situation that you're going through. Think about a situation in your life where it seems impossible to get through. And I want you to think about that for just a moment, but I want you to think about this most importantly. Think about something that you see God doing in your life today. As Jacob said, I'm leaving, I'm going to seminary. I'm rejoicing in the fact that God gave me the ability to preach today. I'm rejoicing in the fact that my family is here. I'm rejoicing in the fact that you guys are here. Because you see, when you, th when you think the things of God, it becomes very easy to rejoice in God because you see what he is doing all around you, what he is doing in your life, what he is doing in the life of believers around you. And you see, what I love about rejoice is that it's not just rejoicing in what God is doing in your life, what he's doing in someone else's life. It's rejoicing in the gospel. See, we heard about the old rugged cross. See, the fact that we can re have rejoice and to rejoice in the fact that God sent his son to die for us should change your life drastically. For non-believers, it shows them hope, what it means to have salvation. But for believers, it makes me joyful to hear the gospel preached because that reminds me of what God did in my life, how he changed my life, what he did for me. You see, the idea of the gospel is that it bridges the gap between man and God. Because our sin separates us from a holy and just God. But through the act of his son dying on the cross, we are able to have a way back to him. A way to the cross, actually. 
You see, the idea of being close to God means being within God, being within God's will. It's proximity. To be near to something and to hold on to that. You see, what I love in this verse is that it really it encapsulates the idea of what it means to know God and what it means that when we know God, what other people see in us. See, in verse 5, it says this, Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. See, what I love in some translations, it says gentleness. It also says that the Lord is near. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but let's focus on gentleness for a moment. Now, as I said, when I was younger, I was not very gentle at times. I would find joy in picking on my sister, getting her going, getting into an argument because I thought that was funny. But you see, that's why I said when I was a child, you see, when we come to know Christ, the scripture, the word of God must mature us. We must leave the things in our past there and walk in the new way. You see, I love in the idea of gentleness. This, if you look in the Greek, if you look in the New Testament language that I was reading in, in the Greek, you will see the idea of gentleness in a different word, priates. I love that word because at first I'm thinking gentleness, that's great. But how do I share what that means? How do I show you guys what it means to be gentle and to have a gentle spirit? See, within looking into this word and what it means to be gentle, actually, well, that's not about me, but it's about God doing something in my life, in my spirit, to make me respond in a gentle way in the midst of a situation. See, gentleness means this, in the Greek, priates, begins with the Lord's inspiration and finishes by his direction and empowerment. It is divinely balanced virtue that can only operate through faith. Now think about that for a moment. I didn't say it has anything to do with me. I don't have to do anything. God is the one doing it in my life. All I must do is respond to what God is doing. You see, when it says this, that it begins with the Lord's inspiration, it begins with God. I don't have to ask for anything. God, when I become saved, when I know what it means to receive Christ, and to be empowered with the Holy Spirit, that is when God starts his work. I don't have to do anything to be worthy of it. And then the second aspect it says is this, and finishes by his direction and empowerment. It means that God himself will encourage us, will empower us, to overcome the obstacles in our life that cause fear, that cause anxieties, that cause doubt and worries. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on God. All you must do is receive it and be open to the things of God. And the last part that I love is this. It's a divinely balanced virtue that can only operate through faith. Think about it for a moment. It can only operate through faith. Faith is What? believing in God and trusting in God in all situations. I have faith that when I go to the cross with my worries, that God will answer me. It may not be next week. It may not be in the time that I want, but it's according to God's timing. Because you see, God's a good father. He loves us. So why would he intentionally do something to harm us? You see, if there's a situation in our life that causes worry, that causes doubt, God's going to answer that because he loves you like a child. See, think about that. For you, some of you guys are grandparents and you love your grandchild. And if they run into something and get a bruise, you start going like, oh my gosh, what can I do? How can I help you? As parents, you're like, buddy, don't do that. You're going to get hurt because you don't want your kid to do something that's going to harm them. But as children, we don't see why our parents are saying, hey, don't run with scissors. Or hey, don't chase after that ball when it goes into the road because we don't know better. But our parents, our grandparents know better. God knows better. So God knows what he will do in our life. You see, as I mentioned, faith is trusting in God, believing in God. Now what I love is that, as I mentioned, the gospel bridges the gap between man and God through the cross. There's nothing that you can do or I can do to bridge that gap, except for believing in God, believing in what he did on the cross for us. And that's the idea of prayer, is that when God bridged the gap between man and God, he allowed communication to flow freely. 
authentic communication at that. And I know some of you guys think it's hard, like when you worry about something to really know what you want to say, or you're afraid that if you tell someone like, hey, I'm struggling in this area, and I'm in ministry, I don't know what to do, or hey, if I tell my spouse this, is this going to cause an argument, or if I tell my child this, are they going to love me any less? We don't have to have that fear with God. It's authentic communication. And when we have authentic communication with God, change occurs. Because we are able to go before the cross, we're able to go before God with this worry, with this doubt, with this fear. Now, just so when I was younger, I had a lot of anxiety. And it's one thing to go and talk to your parents. It's one thing to go talk to a friend to find help. But it doesn't fix the, it doesn't fix the issue. It's not a solution. It's a temporary fix to something. So my encouragement for you guys is this, is that if there's a situation in your life that seems impossible for you or anyone around you, it is. But it's not impossible for God. Think about that for a moment. It may be impossible for you, and in the minds of other people, it's impossible. Because I'll tell you this. In my life, if I was to talk to a 14-year-old Brian, I'd tell him, like, hey, you're going to be preaching at Calvary when you're 23. I would say, no, that's impossible. It is impossible in my own power, but through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, through God, it is possible. And you see, as I said, when we have open communication with God, authenticity, our life changes because we are able to go before the cross, before our God, with our fear, with our depression, with our anxiety, with our worries, and leave it there. Think about that for a moment. When you go to a parent or you go to a friend with a problem, you take it with you. All you get is maybe a word of wisdom or an insight or advice, but you still must do something to fix the issue. In my mind, why would I want to go to a friend with an issue like that that seems impossible in our standards, but it's not impossible to God? So why would I want to go before the cross, go before God in prayer to find peace, to find comfort, to know what it means to be loved by God, means to know peace. Because that means that God is not going to harm you. God will not do anything in your life to make you worry, to make you doubt, to make you be fearful. So what I love through prayer, actually, is that prayer allows us to really speak what is in our heart, to speak what we are worried about, what we're fearful of. Now, as I said, when I was younger, I, I came to Christ when I was 14. I had a lot of baggage in my own life that I had to deal with. And it was impossible in my eyes. Before God, it was easy. All God wants is to us to walk with him and to be empowered by him. And as I said, I'm 23, so I graduated college last year. And probably the typical senior in college thinks, hey, I have a job after college. I am set. I don't have to worry about anything. But parents know, grandparents know, it doesn't always work that way. You see, I got a job in social work right out of college through my internship. I was like, yes, I don't have to worry about it. While other kids in my class were trying to find a job post-graduation, I was like, hey, I'm already doing my work. But you see, things change. I remember in September, we, um, we were all huddled into this little tiny office, and we found out the worst news that they could have said. Our contract is ending at the end of the month. It means I had less than 30 days of work. Now, in, this, in, in my natural reaction, I was like, oh, man, like, what do I do? How am I supposed to pay for stuff? Or what am I going to do? Like, I don't have any other connections for work. But you see, instead of worrying about it, instead of being fearful of what could happen, I did something about it. I went before God. I went before the cross to really hash out with God. I said, okay, God, here I am. I have no job at the end of the month. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to go to missionary work? Do you want me to go to seminary? What do you want me to do, God? 
It's according to your will now. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. And you see, when we go to the cross, we find comfort and peace in knowing that God is going to work in that. We need to take just a moment and be still before God to see clarity in our situation. Because when we are anxious, we're not thinking about what could happen or we're not thinking about what is happening right now. But when we go before God and be still, we find peace and comfort in that. See, what I love about that is, as I mentioned, when I went to the cross, I found peace because God was in control. I was able to share that with my coworkers. At the end of the month, when they're all worrying about what they're going to do for work, I mean, one of my coworkers had an eight-year-old child. She was trying to figure out how to pay for him and pay for all the stuff that she needed to do. But I was able to be like, hey, I'm not worried because God is in control. And we're able to profess that peace that we have. For someone, it, it shows something drastic in our life that they're missing. See, as I said, when we were to profess that, we were to attribute that glory to God. We were able to praise God for what he is doing, the work that he's doing in our life. So much in verse 4, to rejoice in the things of God. When we actually rejoice in God and we rejoice around other people, that means we are praising God for what he is doing, what he will do. So I love in verse 7, it says this, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Think about that for a moment. Let me just say that again. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's not about me. I don't have to do anything but pray to know peace, to find peace in my situation. As I said, that really results an idea of praising God for what he is doing. As I said, when I lost my job, I could be like, okay, God, what am I going to do? But I praised him for it. He says, okay, God, I'm not tied down. I don't have a wife and kids up here. I don't have a job up here in a couple weeks. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Think of that. It was a bad situation in our eyes, but I praised God for it because I knew God would work. So think about that. Praising means this, actually. It means to call attention to his glory. Think about that. To call attention to his glory. It means to identify that what God is doing in your life that is positive should be given to him, not us. Think about verse 8 for a moment. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There's our solution. Why think about A, B, and C when we can glorify God instead? Think about that. Why worry about, okay, God, I just lost my job. Or, okay, God, my family member is sick. What do I do? What am I supposed to do? Instead, go before the cross. Praise God for that. Because you know that in the midst of that situation, God is working in their life, in your life. You can encourage other people around you, like say, hey, I know your mom is sick, but... You can rejoice with them in the fact that, hey, I also heard that your daughter just accepted Christ. Or, hey, I just heard that your daughter just shared the gospel with one of her friends. It's about our mindset. If we have a negative mindset that impacts our interactions with other people around us, but when we praise God and have a positive mindset, it impacts the people around us. You just got to think it. Now, what I love about praise is this, actually. It's acknowledging that, God, you're bigger than my circumstance. So, God, you're bigger than my anxiety. You're bigger than my fear. You're bigger than my fear of rejection. You're bigger than the worrying about traveling to Colorado. Because I know that you will glorify this according to your will. 
It's not about my control. It's not about my thoughts. But God is in control. And it's having my focus on him. Lastly, when it comes to praise, just think about this. As I said, the encouragement that it gives to the believer, to the non-believer, think about that. When you're able to see a Christian that is struggling in their faith because everything around them seems like it is impossible for them to acknowledge or impossible for them to deal with, it's like, hey, come with me. Come to the cross. You can point them in the direction of peace. You can point them in the direction of God. Now, for the non-believer, think about this. They don't know peace. They don't know God. So they don't know what it means to have peace, to have understanding of what it means to have joy despite what is happening. So you're able to share that with them. It was like, hey, look, I know that this is happening in your life, but I know a God who can change that, who can show you what it means to know peace. I love it. You see this on Facebook. You see it on the Internet. No God, K-N-O-W, no peace. No God, no peace, N-O. Think about that. Our proximity with God, our prayer, our praising of God impacts those around us. They encourage them, and they show witness to God. Now, lastly, think about this. Practice. It's great to know how to pray, It's great to know how to read scripture. It's great to know that we can go to God, the source of peace. It's one thing to know that, but it's another thing to do it. Think about that. If I have all the answers, but I don't write it on a piece of paper, I get a zero at the end of the day. See, I was at a small group last night, and my buddy buddy John was talking about cars. And he had said that the body comes together so if you, don't, if you have an engine, but you don't have a transmission, the car is not going to run. If you have the transmission and the engine, but you don't have the wheels, it's not going to move. So think about that. If you have all that, but you don't put the key in the ignition and turn it on and move, you're just sitting there. You're sitting in a $60,000 car and just like, hey, yeah, this is great. I own this car. It goes fast. But unless you turn it on and use it, it's pointless. That's our faith in Christ. If we worry, but we don't go before God, we're not truly finding freedom in that. We're not finding what it means to have joy before God, to rejoice. So I want to point you guys to the text because the words that I'm sharing are from God. They're from what God is showing me in my life, the passion that he has given me. So in verse 9, it says this, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Think about that for a moment. This is Paul writing to us. So he says this, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, what you have seen as an example in my life, look to that as encouragement, as an example of what you can do. As I said, he was in prison. Now, I know for me, I would not be rejoicing in what God is doing because I'm in prison. I would be worrying about how am I going to get out or, hey, are they going to kill me because I'm a Christian? But he was rejoicing in fact that he was able to encourage his brothers and his sisters despite his situation. Now, I really want to point to you this idea of practice. It's having knowledge and using it. So think about this. If we look to scripture as an example of what to do, but we don't do it, what's the point then? I can read scripture all day long, but once I meditate on it and pray and think about it, what's the point? It's just another book that I'm reading. Now, if you guys know me, I don't like to read books. I buy books and I don't read them. I open the first page and I read it. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll get back to it later. But the scripture should not be a book like that. See, we should look to it for guidance. We should look to it for wisdom. This is peace. Remember, to know God means to know peace. So when we look to his word, we are getting pointed to the source of peace. We're getting pointed to the cross. We're getting pointed to God. 
And I want you to think about this in two ways. There's two types of people. There's two types of Christians. Those, think about this. Those who need to refocus their hearts and their minds on Christ. Those who need to acknowledge that, okay, God, I'm fearful, I'm worried about my situation, but I want to change, I want to focus on you. That's one type. The second type is this. There's those Christians who are focused on God in the midst of their storm, in the midst of their season. They are acknowledging, okay, God, you are here with me now. And see, they have a responsibility to encourage you. Think about that. As Jacob said, our friendship, we poured into each other. We didn't just say, okay, Jacob, hey, I'm going to disciple you. It's okay, Jacob. We're going to learn together. That is the idea of biblical friendship that transforms lives. So think about that. A community of believers should see change in every person's life. For those who know peace, it encourages them to know that they can share what God has done in their life. The one who doesn't know peace, who doesn't truly understand what it means to know God and walk in the things of God, they're able to be kind of taken under the wing and pointed to the cross. So think about that today as you guys leave. Which one are you? Do you need to really refocus your hearts and your mind on Christ and look to Scripture for guidance to know peace in the midst of a situation? Or are you a believer who can walk, along, walk alongside someone to change their life? That's, that's discipleship. To pour into the life of another person, to show them God, to show them change, and to share that change. Now, as I said, I'm going to seminary. And that's kind of a weird concept for me. Why would I want to go so far away from Vermont, from my family, from my friends? It's 1,800 miles. But it's worth it because I know that I can get prepared for what God is doing in my life. I can go to a new area and show people God. I can share with believers the encouragement that God is doing in my life. Now, in close, I want to share this with you. I know this text can seem challenging to understand. I know that it can seem very hard to put into practice. But I'm not asking you to go out those doors and change your life immediately. I'm not saying that you have to leave everything, all that anxious and worry right now. What I'm saying is, go before God. It's, It's not about me. It's not about me being up here preaching the word of God. It's about the source of that knowledge is from God. So I want to encourage you to go before God with with a worry this week, with a doubt or a fear that you have this week and leave it before God. Because we all know habits are hard to break, but they're very hard to start as well. So start with that. Before you leave today, think about your life. Think about what you need to change in your life, a situation that you cannot do on your own and bring before God. I want to pray. God, I thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for the ability to speak your word, God. The truth in this text is remarkable, God. To see my life changed, to hear about other people's lives being changed according to your word is encouraging to me. So God, I pray today, Lord, as people leave this place, God, they will not leave this place unchanged. They will be able to go before you, go before the cross, and really be authentic with you on what is happening in their life. Amen. Now, before I leave, I want to actually have family talk, as Dave would say it. See, as Jacob said, I'm leaving. I actually leave next Monday. And so I want to thank you guys for what you guys have done in my life. You guys have spoken truth into my life. You guys have spoken wisdom and encouragement into my life. I want to thank you guys for, open, for opening those doors and welcoming me instantly. I want to thank you for the opportunity to work with your children in youth ministry in Awana. Because I know as a parent, you're like, who is this new person here? <laughs> Trust me, I've been there. But I want to say thank you for the opportunity to serve you guys, 
for you guys to also serve me in all that we do. I know a lot of you guys have you guys been praying for me. I appreciate that. Because a pastor up here is, not, is nothing about the church that he preaches to, that he shepherds. So I want to say thank you for that, for the encouragement, for the wisdom that you guys have shared with me. Thank you. Let's say thank you to Brian.
Thank you. You are dismissed.